Father in heaven, I'm thankful for all that you have done for us as we've been in this place. Whether we hear or whether we forbear, you have spoken. And I'm thankful for your voice going forth, for your word being proclaimed. And it is my prayer that you would grant us all hearts of flesh, that your word might be indelibly impressed upon us, that we will not simply be hearers, but we will be doers of thy word. Many have already began their travels back to their respective residences. We pray for traveling mercies for them. But we ask that the same Holy Spirit that we are pleading for to move in our hearts right now as we go into your word will move on their hearts as they are driving home to convict them, to empower them, to guide them that they might be saved. Please, may your word be made plain to our understanding. And Father, I just pray a special prayer for myself that you would just truly cleanse me of all pride, all of my self-trust. Have thine own way. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to the book of Psalm chapter 11. Psalm chapter 11. I don't intend for my presentation this afternoon to be long. But what I intend and what God intends are two different things. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 11, Psalm the 11th division, and we're going to begin at verse 1. Once again, Psalm the 11th division, and we're going to begin at verse 1. Just let me know that you're there with me by saying amen. amen. Psalm the 11th division, and it says in verse 1, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready that arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. The Bible tells us that God has a people that trust him. Amen? They said, Lord, in you we put our trust. But there are some that are saying to them, flee as a bird to your mountain. The Bible tells us in verse 2, Lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready the arrow upon the string that they might privily shoot at the upright in heart. That word privily in the original language means that they might do it in obscurity, in secrecy, in secrecy. It literally gives the understanding that the wicked are seeking to ambush the upright. Are you following right now? Brothers and sisters, there's an ambush going on. The upright are being ambushed by the wicked. Who are the upright? What does it mean to be upright? Somebody said born again believer. To be right with God? No one wants to answer the question. You're just looking at me in my face. I'm asking you a question. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Who are the upright? Those that are righteous? Okay, go with me to Psalm chapter 19. Because in Psalm chapter 19, God says that there is a prerequisite to being upright. Psalm chapter 19. In Psalm chapter 19, beginning at verse 13, you know this scripture very well, I believe. It says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. And what else? And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. I'm so sorry. I'll go back over here. I didn't know I have parameters. Okay. Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us here that the upright are those that are kept back from performing presumptuous sin. Before we deal with this issue of presumptuous sin, I just want to illustrate, I just want to highlight one point. God hates sin. 
from Genesis to Revelation, it is very clear that God hates sin. But what God hates more than sin is presumptuous sin. What is presumptuous sin? Somebody looked at me and said, really? What is presumptuous sin? Obviously, God has given it a different definition from sin. Am I right? He said it's presumptuous. What is presumptuous sin? Say it. Prideful sin? You s willful sin. Presumptuous sin is when man commits an act of sin with full knowledge that that which he is doing is sin. I'll say it again. Presumptuous sin is for man to enter into an act which he knows is a transgression against the will of God and he has full knowledge that that which he is doing is transgressing the will of God but he presumes that while he is being disobedient, God will have mercy. God hates sin but what he hates more is presumptuous sin. Are you following right now? Matter of fact, I'll show you this from the Bible. Go with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John, brothers and sisters. 1 John, 1 John, and we're going to chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Because the upright are those who are kept back from performing presumptuous sin. I want you to see that God despises presumptuous sin. In 1 John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, most of you are familiar with this. It says, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. But if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. What things is John talking about? All the things that are contained in 1 John chapter 1. Are you with me? Everything that's contained in 1 John chapter 1, because 1 John chapter 2 is simply a continuation of 1 John chapter 1. He talks about God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He says, if we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If you continue reading 1 John chapter 1, you see how John clearly lays out that God has no portion with darkness or sin. If you're in sin and you say you're in fellowship with God, it's not the truth. You're a liar. But if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of your unrighteousness. But in sin, you can have no harmony with God because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Are you with me right now? And he says, I'm telling you these things, little children, that ye sin not. I'm giving you this information that you might understand how abhorrent sin is to God. However, if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What do you think that he's saying right there? Little children, I'm telling you these things that you don't perform sin, but I know you're going to sin, so you still have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Do you think that's what he's saying? No. First of all, he said, my little children. He didn't even just say my children. He said, my little children. Is a little child one that is fully matured or one that is maturing? Maturing. Does that make sense? Okay, I have a little child right now. Her name is Heaven. She's currently four years, four years old. Two years ago, she was two years old. Simple mathematics, amen. She was two years old. Now, when my daughter was two years old, there were things that she did that although they were a transgression against the will of daddy, I certainly had to have extreme mercy. Are you following? You know, I have to say to her, oh, heaven, you know, daddy needs these things to make videos. They don't float. Are you understanding what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you can't destroy them. Even though it hurt me, I knew that she had limited knowledge, hence I had to deal with her upon the basis of the knowledge she had or did not have. Are you following what I'm saying? Now my daughter is four years old. She has two more years worth of knowledge of being with daddy and understanding what daddy desires of her in the home. Are you with me now? And so if she was to perform some of the same works that she did when she was two years old, now that she's four years old, I know that she's not doing it absent of knowledge. She's doing it presuming that father will be merciful. Are you with me right now? Are you getting the point that I'm trying to make? 
He says, little children, I write these things unto you that ye sin not. However, because I know you're going through the growth process, as you're seeking to obtain to the will of the Father, as you're seeking to mature into the same full measure and stature of your elder brother, Jesus Christ, and perchance you slip in the process, no worries, there's an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The blood was shed for that. Are you getting the point right now? Jesus Christ will still stand as your advocate if while you are growing in Christ, perchance you fall, not presumptuously, not premeditatedly, but are you with me right now? Now, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ conducts himself currently as our great high priest, as our advocate. What work did Jesus or what act did Jesus have to what work did Jesus have to uh, uh, go through? Or what act did he have? You have to be with my mind right now. I'm a little bit tired. What act did Jesus engage in that gave him the right to currently stand as our advocate? Say it again, my brother. He gave himself. He gave himself as what? As a sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Go with me back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I say back because we looked at it another day. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 34. This is critical to understand, and I know we may be familiar with it, but it is critical for us to have this point right at the forefront of our minds as we move forward to another point that is spoken of in the scriptures on this point. In Romans 8 and verse 34, the Bible says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that has died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So because of his death, and resurrection, he can now stand at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us as our advocate. Amen? And as Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father as our advocate, he continually presents the sacrifice that he offered for us on the cross. He pleads his what? His blood. So Jesus acting as our advocate and Jesus presenting himself as a sacrifice for our sins are one and the same. Are you getting the point right now? This is critical. Why? Go with me to the book of Hebrews now and you will see why I've taken the time for us to have this point very fresh in our minds. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, looking now at verse 26, the Bible says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Would that not be defined as presumptuous sin? For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Are you seeing what's going on here? The Bible says if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, if we presumptuously sin, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Or in other words, Jesus Christ in that hour does not stand as our advocate. Are you seeing the point? The only hope that we have to look for in that space of time is not the hope of eternal life, but of fiery indignation and the judgment that will devour the adversaries of God. You see, this scripture, or these two verses of scripture, are not declaring to us the unpardonable sin. It's declaring to us that God will not pardon us while we are willfully sinning. Are you seeing the point? Look at me. Once again, we're going to the book of Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 17. Galatians chapter 2 and the 17th verse, the Bible says, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Is Christ going to seek to administer his blood on your behalf in the courts of heaven if you willfully sin? God forbid. Because that would mean that Jesus now becomes an accomplice to your sin. 
God forbid. And the upright brothers and sisters are not seeking to place Christ in that position. The upright realize that it is abhorrent in the sight of God to willfully transgress his law when they have full knowledge of that which God has called them to do or not to do. And they know that all of these biddings of God, they are capable of obtaining to by faith in the one who died for them and stands for them as their advocate. Are you seeing the point right now? The upright, that is why when God pointed down to Job, he said, have you considered my servant Job? He is perfect and upright. He does not presume upon my mercy. He knows my will and he does not presume that I'm going to be merciful upon him when he, are you getting the point right now? That's why Job was able to say in Job 23 and verse 12, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have not presumed upon the mercy of God. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He esteemed obedience to God more than his own existence. Because if you esteem something more than your necessary food, you esteem the word of God or that thing more than what you need to exist. Job would rather die than to presume upon the mercy of God and sin against him. The upright brothers and sisters are a people that are seeking to live by faith in obedience to the will of God and they will not take the mercy of God for granted and enter into sin the same way that many of us do. Oh, it's the last time I'm going to eat this, Lord. Ah, oh, it's not a big deal. I'll just watch it one time. But they made me mad, Lord. Aren't I just a, didn't you say, be angry? He said, and sin not. Don't forget, and sin not part. Are you with me right now? You understand what we're talking about right now, don't you? God is looking for a people who will not presume upon his mercies, who will know the truth and by faith seek daily, I might even add, moment by moment to continue in his will. He says, only then, go back with me to Psalm chapter 19. This is critical, brothers and sisters. And you will see as we continue to look at Psalm chapter 19 that this is not just some issue that we need to push to the side, but it is critical for those who are seeking to stand in the hour of the mark of the beast. The Bible says in Psalm 19, Psalm 19 once again, in Psalm the 19th chapter, and we're going right back to the very same verse that we begun at. Psalm 19, looking at verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. How many of you have read this verse of scripture many a time in your life? You probably have it committed to memory. Have you ever considered what is the great transgression? I mean, what is the great transgression? Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. You know, when I looked up this statement, great transgression, do you know what I came up with? A revolt of a political or a religious nature. A revolt of a political or a religious nature. Question, is there going to be a rebellion or a revolt on a political or religious nature in the very near future? It's going to be a union of church and will they not be revolting or rebelling against the law of God? Brothers and sisters, can't you realize that if you are going to be presuming upon the mercy of God, Day after day, when it comes to sitting down at the table, sitting in front of the television, interacting with people, and you make these little presumptions upon the mercy of God here and there and say, God will forgive, God will be merciful, then what's going to happen when the issue of the mark of the beast comes because of a union of church and state and you can't buy or sell? Will you not just do the same thing that you've been doing? And say, you know what? God knows I need to eat. He knows I'm hungry. He doesn't want my children to starve. He knows I really don't believe that the Sunday is the Sabbath. If you'll presume upon the mercy of God today, you'll presume upon the mercy of God then. 
and you won't be found innocent in the hour of the great transgression. But that brings us back to Psalm chapter 11. Brother Hudson, are you telling me that the issue of the national Sunday law and the mark of the beast is in the book of Psalms? I'm not telling you, I'm showing you. Are you with me right now? Brothers and sisters, David was just, he wasn't just a king. He was a prophet. The Bible says in Psalm, the 11th chapter, and look at his words. Look at the words. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready the arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. We know who the upright in heart are. They are those who are seeking by faith not to presume upon the mercy of God and to walk in his will so that in the hour of the great transgression, in the hour of the union of church and state, they will be found innocent in the sight of a holy God. But right now, there are some wicked ones on the face of planet earth that are seeking to ambush the upright. Is it possible that the wicked are making preparations for the destruction of those who are seeking to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and God is trying to prepare to stand in a time of trouble such as never was? Are preparations being made for a people such as this? The Bible says exactly what type of war tool of warfare they're going to use or they are seeking to use against the upright it doesn't say it, it doesn't say a knife it doesn't say a sword it says a bow and an arrow now a bow and arrow do you use that for hand-to-hand -hand combat close quarters combat or for long distance warfare so you shoot the arrow over here but then it lands and hits the target over there wait for it but it's coming are you with me right now are you with me right now? Okay, let's go a little bit further. Let's see what the Bible says about the bow and the arrow. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, and we're going to look at verse 3. Jeremiah 9, looking at verse 3. The Bible says, And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. The Bible says the wicked are bending their bows and they're making the arrows ready upon the strings. And the Bible tells us here in Jeremiah 9 and verse 3 that the bending of the bow is actually the preparation of lies. Are there some lies that are being prepared and even going forth from those who are wicked? And it's going forth in obscurity going forth in secrecy. But the target, ladies and gentlemen, are the upright. That's truth. Are you with me right now? Brothers and sisters, who's the father of lies anyway? Go with me to the book of John, chapter 8 and verse 44. The reason I'm asking who the father of lies is is because I want to place the onus square on the shoulders of the one whom it truly belongs to. Because the word of God is clear in Ephesians 6 and verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yes, there are human agents that are carrying out tangible works in this world in which we live, but we know that they're no more than mediums of a higher, are you with me right now? Of a higher power. The Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 8 and verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, for the truth is what? When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Therefore, when anyone speaks a lie, they are, directly at the, they are directly in that space of time under the influence of the devil. Would you not agree? Because you're either serving one master or the other. The two will not inhabit the one at the same time. So when a lie proceeds out of our mouths, that lie came forth because the spirit of the enemy is working within What's the other title the Bible gives for the devil, brothers and sisters? The dragon. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, looking at verse 9. Revelation 12, looking at verse 9. 
and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon is another title that is used to identify the devil, the father of lies. So can I not say that if a person is speaking lies, they are literally expressing this, the spirit of the dragon? And the Bible tells us in Revelation 12 and verse 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are those not the upright? The interesting thing is in Revelation 12 and verse 17, the Bible tells us that the dragon is seeking to make war with the remnant that are the upright, but it never identifies exactly how the dragon is conducting that warfare against the upright. That information is found in Revelation chapter 13. Because in Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 11, the Bible tells us, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake what? Like a dragon. Now, I know you're familiar with these things, but let's lay it out plain. Because the Bible lets us know that there's a beast coming up out of the earth. Two horns like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 2. You can turn your Bibles there if you wish. I'll go forward because I know many of you are familiar nonetheless. In Daniel 7 and verse 2, the Bible tells us, Daniel spake, and sa Daniel, said, Daniel spake and said, oh, no, 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 no. Daniel spake and said, I beheld in my night visions, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Four beasts coming up out of the sea, each one different from the other. Verse 17 tells us, thus he said, are you there with me? These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 23 says, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. There we go. What is a beast in Bible prophecy? A kingdom. If we use contemporary language, we would say a political power. We would even say a state because a kingdom is nothing more than a state that is ruled over by a potentate, a king or a queen. So we're looking at a beast in Revelation 13 and verse 11, a political entity, a stately power coming up out of the earth, which is different from what we see in Daniel chapter 7, because all of those beasts in Daniel chapter 7 are, seed com are seen coming up out of the waters, which we know, according to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, is a symbol of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, nations rising up in a highly populated place on planet earth. But in Revelation 13 and verse 11, this beast is not rising up out of the sea or in a densely populated area. This beast is rising up out of the earth, which is a sparsely populated area. Is that clear? And we are told that as this political power rises up, this civil entity rises up, it has two horns like a lamb. And in the book of John, chapter 1 and verse 29, the Bible identifies the symbol of the lamb because it says there, and the next day John see if Jesus coming unto him and saith, you know it already, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So the lamb primarily stands as a symbol of Jesus Christ, which is letting us know this nation, as it was coming into existence, it would primarily promote supposedly at least, the principles of Christ. It would be a professed Christian nation, so to say. Are you with me so far? And it would profess these principles or promote some of the principles of Jesus Christ via these two horns that are like a lamb. Because in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4, horns are a symbol of power. So this nation would exhibit some of the powers or principles of Jesus Christ. And what are some of these things? I'm moving through this rapidly. I'm sorry, but I know that you're familiar with it, and I have other things that I want to share with you, but I like to make everything as plain as possible. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, speaking of some of the principles connected to the Lamb, Jesus Christ himself, the Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Christ is the lamb, amen? 
and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Notice that Jesus Christ, the lamb, brings liberty and he brings freedom. So this nation will promote liberty as well as freedom. And you throw in justice for all in the mix. And what nation do we have? The United States of America. We don't need a history book. We need the Bible. Amen. Amen. It's very clear from the scriptures that this nation is none other than the rise of the United States of America that will promote the principles of the Lamb, liberty and freedom and justice for all, and would do this in a marked fashion by having a republican form, a republic form of government, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and by promoting the principles of Protestantism, freedom of conscience. We can worship what we want to worship, when we want to worship, how we want to worship. But the Bible says that this nation, the nation that I come from, will move from these values because ultimately it will speak like a dragon. And the only way that a nation can speak is through its legislative bodies and its judicial officials. That's why in our, in our representative form of government, we vote for representatives or they vote for representatives. <laughs> and then they go to the Congress and then they draft legislation and then they vote on it. And then they say the people have spoken because they're supposed to represent the interests of their constituents. Are you with me so far? And then when the United States of America Supreme Court interprets the Constitution and then makes a ruling, it is supposed to be the speech of the nation. Brothers and sisters, the Bible lets us know that the United States of America will begin to repudiate the principles of the foundation principles of its constitution, the foundation principles of the republic, the foundation principles of Protestantism to make way for the designs of the dragon. And remember, when the dragon speaks, all he knows to do is lie. You don't remember that, do you? But those lies, they might sound good, but they're to ambush the upright. And what are the lies, brothers and sisters? Because don't you want to know what the lie sounds like so that you can detect it? The Bible lets us know back in Jeremiah chapter 9 what those lies sound, sound like. Jeremiah chapter 9, looking at verse 8. In Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, once again, now we're looking at verse 8. Speaking of those lying bows and arrows, once again, it tells us there, their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his weight. That's an ambush, is it not? So what is, what is, what is the lie? What is the arrow that's being shot out? Peace. We're doing this to secure your peace. This is for the betterment. This is for your... But in the reality... That arrow that's going out, the target is the upright. Look with me. Some of you are familiar with this. Earlier this year, Trump honored the National Day of Prayer by allowing churches and nonprofits to endorse political candidates. If churches and nonprofits can do that, suddenly hundreds of millions of dollars in tax deductible charitable giving becomes part of our political system. And it won't take long for groups of like minded rich people looking at you, Koch brothers, some of the major contributors to the process, to funnel tax free money through churches or set up churches of their own. What this um, article is speaking of is Donald Trump's promise to the evangelical faction within the United States of America that he would get rid of something called the Johnson Amendment. How many of you here have heard of the Johnson Amendment? I need to talk about it a little bit because it is very important and it plays directly into the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The reason why the Johnson Amendment is critical is it's tax law that was put on record by Lyndon B. Johnson. He became a president later, but he was a representative at that time when this became tax law. What it simply states is that 
nonprofit organizations, in particular, in particular churches, cannot, they do not have the right to use voice or finances to influence the political process, to try to put a politician or in office or to oppose um, an, uh, a political p uh, candidate that is seeking to obtain office. Now, throughout the years, they have kind of been a little bit lenient and have allowed some ministers to vocal, um, voice their opinions from the pulpit concerning what, whom they think they should or should not be in power. However, they are very strict when it comes to the financial aspect of this. And the reason they've done this is because they wanted to bind the hands of the churches from being able to have any type of sway within the political process within the United States of America. Let me tell you something. If those chains are removed, the churches become the most powerful entity within America when it comes to the political process. I can illustrate this to you very easily. Some of you have heard of a man by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. You've heard of that before, right? And the whole civil rights movement in the 1960s, all of you are familiar with this. I've heard of it before. Brothers and sisters, the civil rights movement in the United States of America was predominantly led out by the African-American churches. Yes, there were some other churches that were on the bandwagon, but predominantly it was led out by the very poor, I emphasize poor, African-American churches. They came together, they united, they, they, they made their voices heard, and unitedly, they were able to influence the political process to such an extent that they had civil legislation implemented on their behalf. The poor African-American churches. Now, you fast forward to 19, no, 2017, when the African-American churches are no longer poor. Are you following right now? But they have collectively, and it's not just the African-American churches now, but it's the Filipino churches the Caucasian churches, the Mexican churches, all the churches that are now seeking to align themselves in what we know as the ecumenical movement, and they're all a part of this let's get along party right now. And they all realize how they need to work together to bring about radical changes in the United States of America because they see it is only as they work together that they can guard their interests at, in general. Are you following so far? And if you've looked at what's going on in the United States of America, especially over, I can certainly say, within the last five years, but especially in the last two, they have had a multitude of these large events that were ecumenical events in which they are saying, listen, I don't care if you're of this church, this church, this denomination. We need to all come together. We need to pray. We need to make our voices heard because the political process needs us to be the moral compass for them. Brothers and sisters, if the poor African-American churches, when they came together, were able to influence the political process and have civil legislation implemented, what would the churches be able to do collectively that are not poor anymore, but literally collectively have billions of dollars? What would they be able to do if their pocketbooks were unloosed on Washington, D.C.? They could get any civil legislation they wanted implemented. Churches would become so politically focused that they would forget the primary mission in spreading the gospel and disciplining people. I want you to see the next statement. Trump wants to make churches the new superbox. If the Johnson Amendment were repealed, pastors would be able to endorse candidates from the pulpit, which they currently, which they're currently not allowed to do by law. But it's also true that a lot more money could possibly flow into politics via donations to churches and other religious organizations. So currently, let's say these men that were mentioned earlier, the Koch brothers, they're, they're billionaires. And these men, they tend to always put a lot of money into the Republican Party to try to advance the, um, a political candidate of their choice. Let's, but when they, when they make these types of financial donations, they still have to pay taxes on them. Are you with me so far? What if the churches had the Johnson Amendment removed and now they can be a part of the political process and somebody like the conscious say, hold on a second. Well, instead of me, just I'm just going to go and put it in T.D. Jake's offering plate because T.D. Jake's is going to back the same candidate that we're for and I can get my tax deductible receipt at the end of the year and, and get all that money right back. 
can you understand how criminal the political process will become through the churches? Brothers and sisters, the churches will have more influence than any other entity in the United States. The removal of the Johnson Amendment is the effective removal of the separation between church and state. And Donald Trump signed this executive order to give relief to the churches on that National Day of Prayer earlier this year to give relief to the churches against the assaults of the Johnson Amendment. But because you may not know this, but because it is impossible for the Johnson Amendment to be removed by an executive order by the president, it, does, it demands congressional action for that to take place. Well, no problem for that. Because Trump promised to destroy the Johnson Amendment, Congress is targeting it now. There is currently legislation sitting on the desks of congressmen in the United States of America that will be voted on in months from now that contains within it language that would gut the Johnson Amendment out so much that it would be nothing more than a shell, shell sitting on the shelf. It would just be there by name with no power. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? The churches are getting ready to be unleashed. Great Controversy, page 445. Many of you are familiar with this statement. When the leading churches of the United States of America uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. That is exactly what's coming down the pike. Trump declares a day of prayer for Harvey victims. How many of you heard about this one? So Hurricane Harvey touched down. You know this was something that is very recent. And a few days thereafter... Trump came out on national, in national news and on national television. This was unbeknownst to the public. And he decided that he was going to sign an executive order making a national day of prayer for those who were inflicted by the, by the calamities that were caused by Hurricane Harvey. Now, is, is prayer good? We need prayer all the time. We need to pray right now. Prayer is excellent, brothers and sisters. We need, did the people that were impacted by Hurricane Harvey need prayer? As much as they could get. The interesting thing is, look with me, look with me here. President Trump has signed a declaration designating Sunday as a day of prayer. For Hurricane Harvey victims, the president said that it was, an appropri it was appropriate during times of great need to ask for God's blessing and God's guidance. He signed the declaration Friday. What day did he sign it on? Friday after meeting with the faith leaders in the Oval Office. Now, for the sake of not trying to make this any more controversial than it already is, I need to establish the fact that when he signed this declaration, it wasn't, it wasn't for every Sunday thereafter being a national day of prayer. It was for the Sunday that would follow after that Friday to be a national day of prayer for the Harvey victims. Are you with me? But it still begs for us to ask the question, why Sunday? I mean, the calamity was going on. Shouldn't they have just made Friday the national day of prayer? Or why not make it the next day Saturday? Why put it all the way off until Sunday? Why give influence to Sunday? By the way, whose idea do you think it was to make Sunday the National Day of Prayer? Do you think it was Trump's idea? Or do you think it was the faith leaders that were surrounding him in the Oval Office? Because they have been doing what? Influencing. And you can read if you wish. Go do your research if you wish. Because they have been making it very clear. That the evangelicals and the faith leaders and these pastors, they have gained unprecedented access to the Oval Office under the Trump presidency. The type of influence that they have has not been seen in presidencies before. Do you think we might be headed down the road of the fulfillment of Great Controversy, page 445? 
Listen to what this says, brothers and sisters. The Sunday movement, by the way, let's just read it. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. Is that not secrecy? Is that not obscurity? Is that not what we saw in the book of Psalm chapter 11? The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. Listen closely. The leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. I firmly believe that Donald Trump had no idea what he was doing. A man that calls 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians could not understand what he was doing. But is he being influenced by others that know what they are doing? That have an agenda and they're seeking to manipulate this man to accomplish their designs. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. There it is. Just the other day, when I say the other day, I shouldn't even say the other day. It was just this morning. It came out in the news that Donald Trump said that he is going to stop cold the attacks against Judeo-Christian values in the United States. He's going to stop cold all the attacks. This man is talking like he's the return of Constantine the Great. He's playing right into the hands of the churches. Why? Because he knows he needs their influence. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite with the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. They are working in blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation, and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. That's where we're headed. I want you to turn your Bibles back with me to Psalms chapter 11. Brothers and sisters, movements are being made in the United States of America right now to repudiate the principles of our Constitution, the foundation principles of our government that provide for us liberty and freedom and justice for all, that give us the opportunity to worship according to the dictates of our conscience, to truly be able to be Protestants. Are you following so far? But the Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 11 that a change will take place as a result of the wicked seeking to ambush the upright. And the word of God says something interesting right here in Psalm chapter 11, looking at verse 3, and this is the cry of the upright. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Where does this cry come from? Why are the upright saying, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the what? What shall the righteous do? Why are they saying that? Are they not saying it as a result of the fact that they know that the wicked are bending their bow and shooting the arrow at them? Are you getting my point right now? So whatever those arrows are, which we saw are lies, brothers and sisters, those arrows will attack the foundations. Brothers and sisters, you know what that word foundations there mean? It means the basis for political or moral support. The basis for political or moral support. Why does this make any sense to what we're looking at? It makes a lot of sense. What is the very basis? What is the political basis for me to be able to conduct myself as a Bible-believing Protestant in the United States of America? The Constitution. That is the very political basis. And with these, legis with these pieces of legislation that are getting ready to go forward, what is getting ready to be destroyed? The very foundation that supports my rights 
to worship God according to the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. They, and the righteous say, who are the righteous? The upright. And the Bible says in Psalm 119, and you know this well, Psalm 119 and verse 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall God's commandment keeping people do? Lord, there's no more protection for my religious liberties. They're telling me that I can't worship on the day that you said that we are to worship. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Look at what God's response is. You know, God always has a response, doesn't he? The Bible says in Psalm 11 and verse 4, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Why is it that when the righteous are saying, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Why is the response, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his throne, is on his throne in heaven. Why is that a good response? I'll show you why. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 97. Psalm chapter 97. Brothers and sisters, it actually ties into something that you heard a little bit earlier before I stood before you this night. Because the Bible says in Psalm 97 in verse 2, speaking of the throne of God, clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. The word habitation means foundation at the foundation of the throne of God is righteousness and judgment what is righteousness according to Psalm 119 and verse 172 the commandments the same way when you went into the most holy place of the sanctuary and you saw the ark of the covenant in the ark of the covenant was the covenant the ten commandments on top of which you find the mercy seat which is a symbol of the throne of God what is at the throne of God the commandments of God and if you have a throne, you have a kingdom. What's the point? God is saying to his servants, it makes no difference what men do on this earth. It makes no difference if men try to outlaw my law and say that you cannot obey it. The throne of God is firmly established in heaven. You have help from heaven because my commandments are firmly established at my throne. And the kingdom of heaven is with, are you with me right now? the children of men who are upright. It doesn't make a difference what's going to happen in a very short space of time from now. The whole world will hate us for his namesake, but the throne of God will stand sure and it will stand in defense of the upright. And what will God do with the rest? The Bible tells us back in Psalm chapter 11, Psalm chapter 11, I want you to see that the Lord is pointing us to the final issue of the mark of the beast right here in Psalm the 11th chapter. Once again, we're looking at Psalm chapter 11. As we come to a close, the Bible tells us in verse 6, upon the wicked he shall rain sneers, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. Brothers and sisters, do you see anywhere else in the Bible that the portion of the wicked will be fire and brimstone from a cup? It's in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. God is letting us know right here in Psalm chapter 11, that right now the wicked are seeking to ambush the upright. 
They are making preparations to deal with those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to bring upon us a time of trouble such as never was, but in that hour when it may appear as though there is no help for us on this earth, there will be help for us in heaven. Brothers and sisters, if you look at the scripture, the Bible says in this hour, the eyes of God. Look at it. I want you to see this quickly. It says, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Just like when Jesus was going through his great crisis. Do you remember that? Do you, rem do you realize that the crisis of the cross is the parallel for us concerning the crisis of the National Sunday Law? It was the church and state that was united in putting Jesus Christ on that cross. And they crucified the Lord of Sabbath. Making void the one whom was the very living embodiment of the law of God. And if you look at all history concerning the Romans, the Roman soldiers were worshippers of the god Mithra, which was the sun god, and when they crucified somebody, they were offering sacrifice to the sun god. So at the same time they were making void the life of the Lord of Sabbath, they were paying homage to the sun, the church and state together. Our crisis is going to be the same. And remember, as Jesus was going to the cross, we are told in inspiration that he could not see through the portals of the tomb. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou what? Forsaken me. He thought that God was not with him. The Bible says that the eyelids of God are trying the hearts of men. Look, it will appear as though the eyes of God are not on us for a short second. It will be just like a blink of the eye of God. Are you with me right now? Because he'll be there for us. A few years ago, as I was working as a call porter, you know, the Lord blessed me with many, many different experiences. And I wish I shared more testimonies as I was here, but I was not moved to. But I know that some of the things that the Lord has allowed me to experience in my journey over the course of the last few years as he called me out of the world into full-time ministry. I know many of these, these, these instances and these, uh, these interactions that I've had with different people in different spheres of life were not just for myself, but to share with the people of God. And I remember that as I was working as a call porter, I began to try to gain access to these various different Sunday churches. And I used what God has given us to open up the hearts of those that are stubborn, and that is the health message. And so as I was seeking to use the entering wedge to get into these various Sunday churches, I remember one day I went to this one series of buildings, white buildings, and one looked like a big church, and it had a nice size steeple on it. And I thought to myself, well, this must be a really nice church. Let me see if I can get some access into here. And I got into the building, and I walked around, and I found an office, and there was a secretary in that office. And when I let her know what my purpose was for being there, then she informed me that I was at the headquarters of the ecumenical movement there in New York City. Now, I was surprised, but you know you're a call porter, so you keep your cool. <laughs> and then she got on the phone, and she made a quick phone call, and shortly thereafter, one of the directors came out to meet me. And I extended my hand to shake his hand, and interestingly enough, the man didn't shake my hand. But I had to remember I had a mission, I had to stay focused, and so I didn't let that shake me. I just began to present to him my purpose for being there. As I began to share with him a little bit about my objective, some way or another, and I don't recall exactly how, but the conversation began to turn onto different subject matter from one thing to the other, and we just began to engage in this kind of interesting um, conversation, this interesting dialogue broke out between the two of us, and then all of a sudden, he stepped back for a second, and he put his hand on his chin, and he looked at me, and he said, what school did you go to? And I told him that I had attended Oakwood College for a season in time, and some of you are familiar that Oakwood College is one of our Seventh-day Adventist institutions. He rubbed his chin a little bit more, and he said, I knew there was something different about you. You're a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? I was shocked that this man knew of the seventh, that Oakwood was a Seventh-day Adventist 
institution. So I said, yes, sir, I am. He paused again and he rubbed his chin. Then he said to me, you know what? Best minister that I ever heard was a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. He said, that man sure did know his Bible. Praise the Lord. And he, he literally, for the next three to four minutes, rained accolades on this minister's head. But then he paused, and what he began to say next shocked me to the very core of my being. He paused and said, so you know what we're doing here then. You know about the Council of Nice. You know about the Council of Laodice. You know what Constantine the Great did in 321 AD. This man literally began to go through all of the history that I would use in a Daniel and Revelation seminar to incriminate the Roman Catholic Church unequivocally as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. I was shocked. My mouth was open. I could have caught every fly in the room easily. And then I, then I straightened up myself and I got real militant. And I looked at him and I said, so you know that I know what you know. <laughs> and he just lowered his head. This interaction took place one day after my late father and I were driving down the highway, the freeway, and we were talking about Bible prophecy, and my father looked at me and he said, Chris, I wonder, do you think that some of these men that are a part of this movement to make Sunday a day of rest, know what they're doing. And then God gave me that interaction the very next day. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. We think it's a joke. The reason I say we think it's a joke is because when we leave this place, how do we really live? When no one is looking but the omnipotent, omnipresent eye of God. Are we living like we're in the last days? Because if I ask you right now, are we in the last days, the majority of the time if I stand before an Adventist congregation and say, do you believe we're living in the last days? They all come together like a choir of heaven and say, amen. Then I ask, how many of you are living like we're in the last days? And I hear crickets. Brothers and sisters, we may not be making preparations, but they are. And they know who we are. They're making ready the arrow upon the string. And we're walking casually along while the ambush is on for the upright. Though we may not see where all the arrows are flying from, it's not even necessary. Though it is good and it's advisable, it's not even necessary. What's really necessary is that we pray, Lord, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and innocent from the great transgression. The greatest preparation that we can make for the crisis is to repent and turn from our sin now. Because only the upright will stand. And so this is my appeal as we close the camp. You have heard valuable information from every speaker. Any one presentation accepted into your heart and truly considered to the end, I believe, could minister to your eternal salvation. But all of them collectively, tucked in the back of your memory, as you continue to go forward to the cares of this life, will do nothing for you. Brothers and sisters, we must stand. We must stand make decisions this day to give our hearts without reserve to Jesus. And so that's my appeal. If it is your desire to be numbered amongst the upright in these last days, if it is your desire to be amongst those that will be able to pass through this crisis and know that although all nations may hate you, 
for his name's sake, the throne of God will stand on your side. It is my appeal to you to give your heart to Jesus today. And whatever sin could possibly bar your entrance from the courts of heaven, lay it on the altar now. Do you want to do that? Let's kneel and pray and ask God to purify us and make us whole. Father, I'm thankful for the privilege of being at this camp to be able to fellowship with those of like faith and to once again have my heart stirred up and the light set before my eyes to consider my days, to consider my standing in the courts of heaven, to consider the nearness of the second coming of Jesus Christ, to consider that souls will be lost if I first refuse to be saved. Lord, you see that we have made decisions all throughout this camp meeting and once again we have made a decision to surrender our sin that we might be eternally connected to our Savior. Please, whatever our besetments may be, we pray for grace to be delivered. And Lord, as we leave these campgrounds, may your spirit speak to us with clarity that we did not know before we came to this place. So that as the enemy seeks to come in like a flood, the standard will be clearly erected before our faces. Keep us in your care. Thank you for hearing our prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.